Hi everybody, once again, we're talking from now on about way more interesting variations and way more practical things. For example, uh, from tonight, I'm just going to start explaining you how to play against the Philidor's defense. Well, Philidor's defense appears after e4, e5, knight f3, and d6. Probably in most of the games uh, when you play them, uh, your opponents play like this. And we're just going to divide this Philidor defense into five different variations. So definitely the most logical move here is just d4, where we open up like both the bishops, fight for the center, uh, also uh, fight for these e5 and d4 squares, trying to just uh, immediately uh, put some pressure on the e5 square, and black has to react. Uh, very common reactions are knight f6, and knight f6 is going to go into the main line where I'm going to teach you how to play knight c3, but that's going to be a subject after we check all these side bad lines by black. Uh, there are so many weak players uh, or weaker players who do knight c6, but it's not so bad move. Actually, you have to play bishop b5 uh, that goes into the Steinitz variation of this opening. And this file, I'm going to check in like three videos from now, I believe. And finally, uh, they have like three sidelines. They have the weakest option and very, very common on all kinds of levels. I even seen so many very solid guys who used to do this and they actually got destroyed uh, the way I'm gonna about to show you. Also, they have a possibility uh, to play f5, this kind of gambit. They have a possibility to play knight d7. And finally, uh, I'm going to teach you how to play against the open Philidor when they take on d4. Tonight's subject will be bishop g4. Out of many moves, this one seems to be one of the most common mistakes by black in the Philidor defense. And in the analysis of this game, I'll show you how Fisher. Um, won like two games in absolutely the same way. That doesn't, uh, you know, like happen uh, too often, but Morphy, who played like his famous game in the Opera House like uh, many, many years, uh, decades actually ago, um, he won that game and afterwards Fisher almost won the same way like Morphy. Uh, so after uh, Bishop G4, uh, there is a, one very in interesting point that Steinitz came up with. He said, you shouldn't move out your bishops before you bring out your knights. Well, that's a very good rule for beginners. So bishop g4 is weak move and that's the subject of the lesson. Uh, d takes e5. Right now after d takes e5, looks like black must give up his bishop. Black has to play bishop takes f3. Uh, I believe if they already made a mistake, and play this bishop g4 move, the only interesting move is knight d7. I'll show you now how Gary Kasparov beat somebody, because in uh, I found in many articles and books um, that suggest gambits for black this idea. I have to mention that I faced it a couple of times in Blitz, and that I had to know following refutation, otherwise it would end up differently, probably with zero on my account. Uh, because you have to take on d6, and after bishop d6, you gotta develop your knight. Knight g on f6, and here, Gary Kasparov played bishop e2. And after queen e7, a very simple move is knight to d4. That's a crushing move, that's the move that almost refutes this line, and it immediately uh, puts under very big suspicion the whole system and the gambit for black. So if, if they take on e4, of course, knight e4, queen e4, f3, and you just win either queen or a bishop. If they play bishop e2, queen takes e2. Do not forget, you're up upon already and you're threatening either knight takes a knight f5, uh, winning another bishop or just knight b5. So uh, in my opinion, they have to play this knight d7. But if you know this couple of moves, once again, e takes knight c3, bishop e2. And what even Kasparv didn't go for, knight d4 in his simul game in Croatia 2015, uh, he played something else. He played knight b5, but it was still okay. 
you just have to play knight e4, and this is almost winning for white. I, I told you I would have had lots of problems uh, if I uh, didn't simply remember this knight e4 refutation. After this, black's position simply collapses. They have to take because bishop is hanging. When they take, uh, your knight can jump on these two squares, and they have lots of problems to complete development. And don't forget, queen on e2 defends pawn on e4. That's one thing. And second thing, your knight will jump on f5 or b5, winning the dark square bishop. After d takes c5, they can't play d takes c5. Uh, many of my students ask me why not this, because first of all, you break the castle, and secondly, you win the pawn, clearly pawn up with winning queenless middle game. Uh, they don't have castle anymore, and you threaten to win the bishop or a pawn on f7. That's why Morph is opponent in the opera house, and Fisher. Fischer's opponents in Simul, by the way, this is, this is a curiosity. Fischer played Simul uh, like many, many years ago. That's a fun fact here. And he played two Simul games. Uh, and in the same Simul, same day, both players were defeated exactly the same way. Uh, you won't have, you won't have like such a curiosity that often. So after a bishop takes f3, uh, queen takes f3, d takes e5 and bishop c4 you know threaten to simply checkmate your opponent with the queen f7 most of these guys will play knight f6 uh, and a famous game between morphy and his opponent uh, was with the knight f6 but fisher's games happened with the queen f6 makes sense they just want to make the queens if you win if you take on f6 you would have like a bishop here advantage and slight advantage uh, but actually, Fischer went for queen b3. He was now threatening clearly, queen takes b7, not just to win the pawn, but to win the rook, because queen c6 does not work. Uh, for example, I'm, I'm just going to play a weird move for black, just to show you what the idea is. So you threaten to take the rook, and if they try to defend that, you have a very nice trick where the queen will be gone. Don't forget about this tactical trick. So after queen b3, b6. And this is the first diagram for you. Stop the video and try to find uh, almost a winning move and a strong initiative for white after not immediately, knight c3 to play knight d5. They play c6 and now you should stop the video and try to find great tactical move after which you just uh, increase your tactical chances in the game. Well, if you stop the video, I hope that you found the bishop g5. That's a very good move. And uh, they can't take on g5 because after bishop f7, bishop g8, uh, you just win. You just spoil the castle. You just won that knight. You threaten queen e6 followed by rook to d1 and the mate is on horizon. Uh, that's why uh, Fischer played in both of his games that day in, in, in Simul this bishop g5 and they had to move this queen away on g6. After rook d1, uh, he couldn't go with Long Castle uh, because in case of Long Castle, uh, he would just blunder Bishop with check and he would, I guess, resign the game immediately. So he played Rook D1, threatening mate in one, Rook D8. The guy played the Bishop E7. I just want to show you, for example, if you try to cover this mate with the Knight E7, once again, uh, pause the video, try to find tactics. And once again, I hope you guys found Bishop takes f7, queen f7, queen f7, and rook takes d7, where you win the pawn. Uh, although in the game, uh, the guy didn't play uh, knight d7, but played bishop e7. And after bishop e7, knight e7, please uh, stop here and try to find tactics. I once again hope that you, you, you were able, <clears throat> sorry, you were able to find bishop takes f7. Queen takes f7 and a very beautiful tactical uh, move, rook d8, which we call deflection. So king has to take and we just deflect the king from the queen and of course we win the queen. Uh, okay, uh, quite an interesting way to win in the same simul, two same games. I really like it. Uh, I just want to remind you of one thing, even Gary Kasparov played one more game uh, like this and he also won so when he played after like 
bishop c4, and where he opponent played queen f6, Kaspar played queen b3, and his opponent, when he played b6, knight c3, his opponent played bishop c5 instead of Fischer opponents where they went for c6. Kaspar played castles, and after c6 did a great move, bishop e3. Uh, he developed his pieces, he opened up the back rank, he threatened bishop c5 followed by queen b7, and at the same time, this guy couldn't touch the bishop on e3 because the rook would be open and they would have lots of problems with the f7 square. So after bishop e3, Kasparov's opponent played knight e7, Gary played rook ad1, rook d8, and he played bishop c5. Interesting thing, he couldn't come up with knight c5 because of rook d8, queen a3, and a7 pawn was hanging, just like the b4 move was uh, the very next idea by white. So just like you see, uh, Kasparov won this game like rook a d1, rook d8, bishop c5, b takes c5, and Kasparov threatened the pawn on a7, eventually this knight on d7, pawn on f7 somehow, played rook to d3 with the idea of, I like this uh, multi-purpose moves, he threatens to double these rooks with rook a d1, but also he threatens to play rook f3. The guy played knight c8, and once again we can stop the video and you can find the tactics. I once again hope that you found the rook takes d7, rook takes d7, queen c8, he's just won like uh, two pieces for the rook and uh, for all of you, just a basic reminder, uh, two pieces are way more valuable than one rook, not to mention that uh, sometimes even rook and two pawns, uh, that's sometimes not enough for only, for example, two bishops or two knights or mo in most of cases knight and bishop. Anyways, after like bishop c4, knight f6, you you just have to you just have to remember the following trick. It happened in such a big number of games of my students. I even played like two games like this. Queen to b3. You threaten the pawn b7, you threaten the pawn f7. I remember uh, by the way, this is already a winning move because white is threatening two pawns and furthermore, bishop f7 followed by queen e6 mate. Here I had a game on Chasbra channel while streaming and my opponent played b6. I just captured bishop f7, king d7 and came up with this checkmate queen e6. This is nice mating pattern, you should remember and it happens very, very often. Uh, so guys, uh, we're very close to see one of the most beautiful games uh, that was played so far. Uh, Paul Morphy was white, and that's a famous game from the Opera House. So he played queen b3, and his opponent played queen e7. Uh, here, you have a possibility to take the pawn on b7, but taking on b7 wouldn't be the most accurate move, because after queen takes b7, queen b4, uh, trade queens uh, would definitely uh, prolong a black suffering, but at the same time, it would be a long lasting end game where you would be only up a pawn. So that's why Paul Morphy, after queen e7, played very nice move, knight c3. Uh, now, he couldn't play queen b4 because, in that case, once again, bishop takes f7, followed by queen e6, for example. So that's why they played c6. Uh, they just defended the pawn on b7 by queen on e7. Morphy played bishop g5. He pinned this queen and knight. And also, uh, he just wants to make long castle to complete his development. Now, black, believe it or not, is in some sort of Zugzwang in already ninth move. So he can develop his b8 knight because his pawn on b7 is hanging. For example, if he does this, queen takes b7. Uh, he can play h6 because that would lead to bishop f6. And if queen takes queen b7, if g takes, that would be just a terrible pawn structure. But you can once again play long castle with the idea of bishop f7, queen f7, and rook d8. Similar idea like in Fisher's game. The guy played b5, and now the game was finished after a beautiful sacrifice, and you're just going to be witnesses of one of the most beautiful uh, tactical combinations in the history of chess. Once again, pause the video and find the move 
uh, to carry on with Initiative for White. Well, if you played Knight B5, I'm very proud of you. You guessed the right move. Knight B5. And after C takes B5, Bishop B5, and Knight B7 was forced move. In case of King D8, uh, after the game morph, it pointed out that he would have gone with Bishop D5, followed by Queen D5 and Queen A8, winning the rook on A8. So in the game was Knight B7. He played Long Castle. He's threatening to take the Knight. So this guy had to play Rook D8. Uh, he can take with the Knight or the Queen. Uh, he can't take, uh, he can't castle, by the way, here because of bishop a6 and uh, queen b7 checkmate. So this guy had to play rook to d8. And when he played rook to d8, once again, pause the video and once again, tried to be like one of the biggest tactical players of all times, Paul Morphy. So it's so difficult. Uh, apart from all previous combinations, I believe this is the most difficult one. It's rook takes d7. Uh, he sacrificed an exchange to be able after, because knight cannot capture, queen is hanging on e7, he had to take by rook. And now he just played rook d1, lining up this rook uh, on the d file, and uh, now white can simply take the knight and the rook, and he would be two pawns ahead. Uh, but basically, after queen e6, uh, he could have gone with queen e6, bishop f6, and bishop d7, but he didn't want to satisfy himself with only uh, material and being like two pawns up. And at the moment, I believe, he wasn't even aware of the fact that he was just making one of the most beautiful games of all times. Paul Morphy took on d7. Uh, so... Uh, he's about to come up with brilliancy. Knight takes d7. And once again, for the last time, I'm just asking you to find the move and to find the winning combination. It's once again deflection. Queen b8, check. And after knight b8, rook d8, checkmate. I hope you like this little guidance how to play against the third weak but very common uh, move by black bishop g4. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I hope you enjoyed the games of Robert James Fisher, who won in the same day. I, I keep repeating that, but it's really, really, uh, you know, like a unique thing in chess, winning like insane fashion, two games, same day in simuls. And also uh, you've been witnesses of same, of two games play, played by Gary Kasper in this line and how he crushed his opponents. Hope you like this one. Uh, next time, I'm going to teach you how to play against the uh, e4, e5, knight f3, d6, d4, and f5. And <clears throat> hope you're just going to uh, carry on uh, donating. And we just appreciate that so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, guys. Thank <laughs> you.